And again, good morning. I'm David Kennedy. I'm the director of the National Network. Um, I am your host, I guess. I am privileged to have all of you here. Um, this is the third of these conferences that we've done. We're now calling them biennial because we want to do them every two years. The first of them was, in fact, 10 years ago, so the math on that doesn't work at all. Um, but this, this is the third of, of these that we have done. The first two, I will say myself, have been wonderful. And they're wonderful because of the people who come to be part of them. The, the finest thing about the work that we all do is the people who participate in it. These, these issues draw really good people. Um, at least at its best, the work draws the very best out of all of us. And when that clicks, there's nothing like it. And so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for being part of all of this. And let me make now a few remarks. As I've thought about how I wanted to use this introductory time, I was pretty clear in my own mind about where I wanted to go. I couldn't figure out where to start. And that's partly because when you go where this train of thought gets you, it turns out you can start just about anywhere, and you end up in very much the same place. In the end, I started, I decided to start in Chester, Pennsylvania. So I expect there are a lot of folks in the room who, who know Chester, either personally or by reputation. It, it is pretty much our paradigmatic American troubled black community. Um, it's a city of about 30,000 people. It's southwest of Philadelphia. It's not a big city, but pound for pound and rate for rate, it is always amongst and it is sometimes statistically the most dangerous city in the United States. It's the kind of community the National Network and a lot of all of you are committed to in all kinds of important ways. Chester, Pennsylvania is the product of deliberate and relentless racism and discrimination. That's just historical fact. In the late 19th century, it was defined as a ghetto in the classic technical sense. It was created as a place for black folks to be sequestered by white folks. They were used as a pool of cheap labor for a variety of white businesses that operated in the white areas surrounding Chester. Black folks were not allowed to live in the white folks surrounding Chester. In 1917, there was what the history books describe as a race riot. It was an attack by white folks and nearly 100 hastily deputized white law enforcement officers on the black community. Many black folks were killed. Uh, nearly 100 were severely beaten and injured. As the years went on, um, residential segregation was ruthlessly enforced. Banks that lent to, to black families to live in white neighborhoods found themselves shut down by bank examiners, white landlords who rented or attempted to rent to black people and black families found themselves devastated by civil code enforcement. Um, the National Network is engaged with Chester and, and trying and hoping to do work in Chester. Uh, David Noble, who's a National Network staffer, and I were in Chester not that long ago. David's in the back. David, you remember what we saw as we drove off the highway up the exit ramp to Chester the first time? So on the ramp that you, you, you need to drive up to go into Chester, Pennsylvania, there is a lovingly maintained street shrine to a dead young black man on the side of the exit ramp. 
And later on in the, the couple of days we spent in Chester that time, we were told, we were asked, was, was she there? And it turns out that the dead young man's mother will spend three or four times a week part of her day standing out by the place where her son was killed. Um, Chester still had heart all these years, and it still does. The most dangerous place in Chester, Pennsylvania, is a neighborhood called Highland Gardens. And when the black former city employee and current community organizer gave David and myself a, a tour of Highland Gardens, he said, this, this place was pretty good uh, for a long time. And then they put the highway in. And as you sit in Highland Gardens amongst the boarded up houses and the RIP sprayed on the sidewalk and these beautiful, huge murals to the dead that people have painted on the, the, the side of, of these houses, um, you can hear I-95. You can't see it because it's sunken. And in the late 1960s, um, they ran I-95 through the center of Highland Gardens, cut it in half, and of course, it has never recovered from that. What makes American cities like Chester, Chester, those things don't just happen. This was done to Chester and to all the Chesters across the United States. This, this is the history, this is the story of America's troubled black communities. This was made to happen. <sighs> Nothing more powerful has been done to black America and America's black communities than the law and what has been done to them under the color of law. All right, this is just American history. It is the fact of our history. And what one makes out of those facts, a lot of possible variability there. The fact is not at issue. The facts are not at issue. Right, this is a country that was founded on racial violence and oppression. Um, Michael McBride, who will be with us these next two days, said in the video, uh, begins in the antebellum South, antebellum slavery. You can make a case that it begins before that, the, that the nation was founded on transportation, which was the violent and coercive control, as Michael says, of black bodies. It goes through slavery. It goes through the tens of thousands of black men who fought for their freedom in the Civil War and won and got it all taken away during Reconstruction. It is the black codes. It is separate but equal. It is Jim Crow. It is the, as we saw again in, in, in footage, it is the fire hoses and the dogs put on peaceful civil rights marchers. And it's current reality of our current American history, that just at the moment in the 1960s, when the formal statutory changes were made, when the heroic work of the civil rights movement was once again victorious, that that is the moment when in criminal justice we began the war on drugs and the war on crime, we began the relentless march toward what we now recognize as mass incarceration. And we find our ourselves in a place now where, as, as legal scholar Paul Butler has, has researched and shown, that a black man in the country today is actually more likely to spend time in prison than he would have in 1960 before we fixed the laws. Right? It's, it's more dangerous now in terms of criminal justice exposure than it was then. Um, this is the government, right? This is the power of the state. But in all of this, police have been in the forefront, right? Po police have always said, 
we're there 24-7. We are the most visible arm of government, and that's right. And so, for better or for worse, uh, so much of this has ended up being in the eyes of the public and in, in, in the policy conversations and the political conversations, uh, but overwhelmingly in the perceptions and the narratives of the community about the police. And this is not a secret. Um, Tracy Mears, who many of you know, Yale, Yale Law Professor, uh, Procedural Justice Guru, she and I gave a talk along these lines to the entire Chicago Police Department command staff a few years back. And when we finished, a uh, black CPD commander raised his hand and he said two things. He said, thank God we're talking about this because we never do and we have to, it's long overdue. And the second thing he said was, black folks all get this. Look at the pictures of the lynchings. They've all got their hands cuffed behind their back. We know what that means. And if you look at those pictures, he's right. Over and over and over, the dead have their hands cuffed behind their back. So in the history and the narratives and the minds of many, many, many of America's communities today, the legitimacy of the police is desperately compromised. Um, is Ben McBride here yet? So Ben is Michael's brother. Um, they make quite the pair. Ben, thank you. Look, look in the rear, folks. Ben is with us, in fact, today. So um, you'll be spending time with Ben this afternoon. We're going to be doing a screening of this remarkable movie, The Force, about the Oakland Police Department. Ben's a, a figure in the movie. More importantly, Ben has been working very closely in Oakland as a member of the community working with the Oakland Police Department to help them understand these things. And you'll see Ben say in the movie, and I've heard him say, and this has burned itself into my brain, Ben will say to the Oakland police officers, he's trying to help understand this, history has stolen your identity. And that is profound and it is true. So history can include anything up to what happened a minute ago, right? It doesn't have to be long back. But the fact is that the history of the black community with the police pretty much to the present day is that they have been over-policed, they have been under-protected, they have been abused under color of law, they have disproportionately been stopped and arrested and incarcerated and all the rest of that, and they have not been made safe. So there are lots of ways to get at this. Um, David Bernstein, who's a journalist in Boston who recently did special research on this, went back over a number of years and the facts in Boston, Massachusetts it's a good police department. I know them well. I have a lot of respect for the Boston Police Department. Um, there is a 15% clearance rate for gun homicides in Boston, Massachusetts, 15%. When it comes to non-fatal gun woundings, there is a 4% clearance rate. There is impunity for the violence. Uh, Rachel Locke, who is... Um, a member of the National Network staff. I'm going to keep doing this to all of you. Rachel, are you in the room? Back also back here. Uh, all the best people are sitting in the back, apparently. Um, Rachel is developing our international portfolio, portfolio in the National Network, and we'll be chairing a, a panel on this over the next two days. And we, we are thinking about ways in which what's, what's been learned, found to be effective in, in U.S. settings may be applicable in other places. So we, we are engaging with folks who are dealing in Mexico, in Honduras, and Guatemala. And they say to us, some of them, this is really different. These are failed states, right? We are working in places where there's absolute impunity for violent crime. The government can't provide safety. Nobody respects the government. Nobody respects the police. The police are viewed as corrupt. Criminal enterprises dominate the economy. 
Uh, people are left on their own. They have to take care of themselves and their families. And we look at them and we say, dude, we work in Chicago. <laughs> it's the same thing. Right? This is a fundamental failure of civil society. And as with so many other things that folks like us are committed to and work on, none of this is a secret. Right? All, all of this is obvious to anybody who cares to look at it. It is hiding in plain sight. So we have framed these two days, this conference, around history, race, public safety, policing. So what does it mean to say public safety? The National Network has driven its work by a kind of deep commitment to some pretty simple ideas big but simple ideas. Right? Violence is wrong. There are very few people in the most dangerous communities who are in fact dangerous. Everybody, including drug dealers and gang members, want to be safe. The most powerful forces making for public safety and civility come from community dynamics and community forces, not from the power of the state. Everybody who wants help should get it, right? These, these are big, powerful, grounding ideas. And there have to be a lot of very sophisticated answers to the question, what's public safety? But that has to include that at heart, it means freedom from violence and fear in the community, of the community, and freedom from violence and fear at the hands of the state. People should not be afraid of the state and the agents of its authority. America's black communities have not been so free. So we've got folks from Birmingham, Alabama, not sitting in the back, I think. So this is Chief A.C. Roper and, and his, his peers from Birmingham. Um, I spared you the fact that in the 1960s, black folks in Chester, Pennsylvania called it the Birmingham of the North. I thought I would let that one go by, but that's in fact the case. And Chief Roper has been doing some of what we think of as, as trust building and reconciliation work in, in Birmingham. You saw some of that in, in the video. And in in that same table, at that same table where he spoke to black residents, the black men at that table talked about their experience of being citizens of Birmingham in terms of whether they were free. And they were talking about feeling free from the, the fear of and sometimes active oppression of the police. Downtown at certain times of the day, in the day, we're free. Night falls, not so much anymore. Free in my house, not when I'm on the lawn. Free when it's one of A.C. Roper's own police officers who's driving by. Not free when it is a car from an adjoining jurisdiction. And they saw their daily life and their experience of the city in terms of whether they felt safe or not, and they were not talking about being safe from their neighbors and peers. Fatima, are you in the room? This is our very good friend and colleague, Fatima Mohammed from Equal Justice USA. She'll be on tomorrow morning's plenary panel. And in one of our lovely, intense conversations. Fatima said to me, I'd love to be able to look at a police officer and think protector. I can hardly imagine getting there. And it's not just the black community. 
Right? The national network focuses especially on issues involving black folks in the black community. But you hear a version of this from every oppressed group. When we had some of these conversations in Minneapolis, there was a Native American activist at the table who said after quite a while, why are we talking about that? Why aren't we talking about my people? What's been done to my people is even worse. And since it turned out that he had been shot multiple times at wounded knee and had survived and was still activist, I was not inclined to argue with him. Um, our, our gay partners have said, remember our, the origin of our activism, our iconic moment at Stonewall was in fact a rebellion, not just against oppression and prejudice, but against extortion by the New York City Police Department, which is in fact the historical reality there. NYPD used to go into the gay bars and the gay clubs and extort money from the men there in order to not arrest them on morals charges, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, First and foremost, this, this is wrong. It's a historical failure. It's a blot on our nation. It's a failure of democracy. And it has real public safety consequences. So, Nancy Levine, stand up and sing out. Where are you? There you go. So Nancy's a researcher from the Urban Institute. She'll be presenting also over the next couple of days. Nancy's going to present research on public opinion in some of the worst crime hotspots in six cities across the country. The research, the findings are wonderfully clear. The people in those places want to be safe. They respect the law. They hate violence. They think other people should respect the law. They want to work with the police. They're willing to work with the police and they profoundly do not trust the police, they don't have confidence in the police, they don't think the police respect them, and they don't trust the police to control themselves and govern themselves. We now know as a matter of social science fact that that kind of failure of trust leads directly to high levels of violent crime especially in those sorts of communities. As that trust and legitimacy go down, people don't cooperate, they take matters into their own hands, they lose respect for the law, and violence goes up. And the national network remains at its root a violence prevention and public safety shop. And this kind of historically informed lack of trust is a direct input into the high levels of violence that everybody in this room cares about. So we frame this as reconciliation work. I don't even know, we don't know if that's the right framework. Um, people say, how can we reconcile? We've never conciled, right? I get that. So it's, it's our gloss for some deep commitment to recognizing that as long as people of goodwill who care about these issues don't have the grounding and of trust and relationship and common ground so that they can work together to drive change, we're in real trouble. We think we're actually quite optimistic and on a good day convinced that there are ways to do work together to recognize this history, to acknowledge it, to own it, to share perspective, and to get to the common ground that we need to do better work. And we're organizing a lot of the next couple of days around that kind of optimism and what it may take to make that happen. As we do that, we say the police have to go first. If there is going to be this kind of engagement, the people who represent at least the institutions that have had the power, have had the authority, have done the harm, have to go first. And we're going to hear in a moment 
from two such really brave chiefs. We say to our community partners, next, we say to our partners working with community folks, next, listen. What, what those who have been subject to the abuse of power always say, what traumatized people in communities always say is, our voices don't count, people don't listen to us. And so we're going to model the conference on that tomorrow morning at about this time. We're going to open with uh, Mama Nia Wilson. Mama, are you here? Thank you. Who is going to do some spoken word art on exactly this question. We're going to go to a panel facilitated by Daryl Atkinson. Daryl, are you in the room? Daryl Atkinson is senior staff attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. He is a returning citizen, and he is the United States Department of Justice's first Second Chance Fellow. All of this is in the service, not of getting along, it's in the service of getting to a place where we can do real work together. And if we get to the place where we have that common ground, there's a lot of work to do. So the balance of these two days, we've, we've tried to craft to support the thinking about and informing and driving of that kind of work. We want a fundamentally different and sounder understanding of public safety and how to produce it. So there are going to be panels on the science and practice of violence prevention, ways to support our most high-risk populations with particular respect to their experience of victimization on trauma. We've got work on these increasingly clear dynamics about procedural justice and legitimacy, about how that matters as it turns out, not just between the police and the community, but inside police agencies, on actual techniques for framing up and advancing reconciliation, on bringing prosecution into the reform movement, and a number of other things. So we hope all that works for you. We invite your participation. Uh, we're going to have a screening and discussion of this amazing documentary, The Force, about work like, like this in, the, in Oakland and the Oakland Police Department. And then we're going to reconvene at the end of the day tomorrow and see what you think and where you think we should go and how the national network, uh, we hope, can be of service. So that is our gloss for the next two days. Um, I said a moment ago that the police have to go first. So one of the really remarkable things about the current national moment in criminal justice reform is that increasingly there are more and more police leaders who get this and are even eager to step up. I think this represents real democratic leadership and a lot of courage. So I don't see superintendents of education standing up in rooms like this and saying, uh, I, I am responsible for educating your kids. Your kids can't read, they can't do math, we can't control the classrooms. Uh, we're not preparing them for their lives as citizens or employees. They're not ready for the workforce. Uh, that's my fault, I'm gonna fix it. And uh, by the way, I'm gonna put cameras on all of my teachers and you can view the footage and decide whether you think they're doing a good job. Right? The only people I see stepping up and really speaking frankly about these American issues of race and oppression right now are the better police executives, and I think that is an amazing public service. So here are two who have been doing this and are continuing to do it. Charles Ramsey is one of the most respected police leaders of his generation. He began his career in Chicago. He was chief in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia and he is known to many of you as the co-chair of President Barack Obama's task force on 21st century policing. Terrence Cunningham, who you have all seen now because he was on the video, 
uh, was until recently chief of police in Wellesley, Massachusetts. He's the immediate past president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, in which capacity, as you just saw, this past fall, he stood up in full plenary session and apologized on behalf of the IACP and the American profession of policing for the historical harm that they have done. I give you Chuck Ramsey and Terry Cunningham. Thank you, David, and good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning. It's something I've actually been looking forward to. Um, I was asked to speak about race history and policing and provide some personal thoughts on, uh, in those three areas, uh, some based on my experience in law enforcement. Now, for those of you who don't, uh, who don't know me, I've been in policing for quite some time. Uh, I started my policing career in 1968 as a police cadet in the Chicago Police Department. I'm a native Chicagoan, third generation, actually. Um, I've seen a lot of changes in policing over the years, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, I left Chicago after 30 years and took over as police chief in Washington, D.C., where I served for nine years. Um, I did retire briefly for a year, and then I uh, got a phone call from a newly elected mayor in Philadelphia asking if I'd be his police commissioner. I wanted to get back into the business, so I spent uh, eight years as police commissioner in the city of Philadelphia. So. That spans an awful long period of time, 47 years actually in law, active in law enforcement. Um, and when I, when I think about it, we talk about race, we talk about history, and we talk about policing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about those from the perspective of being inside a police department and kind of seeing uh, some of the changes and transformations that have taken place. Um, let me start by saying, uh, race matters. It plays a role in what we do. Not just as police, but as society. It always has. And we just got through talking about some of the history. It's not unique to policing. There's no need to think or no reason to think that policing would be any different. Uh, but as I kind of walk you through some of my own experiences, uh, hopefully you'll be able to pick up how things have begun to change. That doesn't mean that we don't have a long way to go, because we do. There are still an awful lot of, of, of issues. Does bias exist in policing? Yes. Mostly in a form of implicit bias, but there's still racism as well. But we are actively doing everything we can to try to turn things around and to try to get kind of people that can be fair, that can be objective, that can gain the trust of the communities that we serve. When I started in 1968 as a cadet, Chicago, uh, and it still is, unfortunately, but not quite to the same extent it was in the 60s, a very segregated city. And the police department was absolutely no different. In fact, the big social experiment at the time was integrating police cars, putting a black and white officer in a car together as partners. We used to call them salt and pepper cars. <laughs> it was voluntary, though you had some officers that volunteered and we had some successful teams and we had others that were forced to work together and it didn't always turn out uh, that well. Um, I remember an experience when, um, when I was a young uh, police officer my regular partner and I were split up because they wanted to integrate a couple more cars. So the watch commander uh, split us up and had me working with a particular officer. Uh, and it's customary after roll call, you, you just kind of, if you don't know one another, you'll ask, hey, you want to drive? You want to be the recorder? You know, what do you want to do? I, silence. I got nothing. It's okay. I'll drive. 
So I took the keys, we get in the car. This guy's staring out of the window. And I remember saying to him, I said, man, listen, we got eight hours together here. We need to at least have some kind of conversation, some kind of dialogue. And he turned and looked at me and he said, I don't like, and he used the N word. I said, okay. I never will forget, right in the corner of Cermak and Western Avenue in Chicago, I put on the, um, my blue light, I made a U-turn, and I went back to the station. And I watched, and walked into the watch commander's office, and I said, we've got a little personality clash here. I want to work as a solo car. Now, back in those days, that's all you needed to say. I didn't say what he said or how it went down or anything, but they could take a hint and know, okay, fine, you guys go out as solo cars. So you had that sort of thing taking, taking place. The assignments that you'd get in units, specialized units in particular, very, very difficult to get in. Promotional process. When I was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 1977, I was uh, 20, I had just turned 27 years old. I was the youngest African American in the history of the Chicago Police Department to be promoted to sergeant. Now that's not because I was all that smart, it's just because I was there at the right time when I was able to to advance in the department, and that would not have happened had it not been for a lawsuit filed by the African American Patrolmen's League uh, claiming discrimination within the department on, in the promotional process, which held up everything and eventually wound up with a court settlement that uh, caused a, uh, a quota to be established and a number of minorities to be uh, elevated. Otherwise, I'd probably still be pushing a wagon in the 10th district in the Chicago Police Department as opposed to uh, the career path that I wound up uh, taking. So it exists. There's no question about it. When I hear people talk about this whole quote unquote no snitching, they act as if that's something new. It's not new. I remember when I worked on the west side of Chicago, there were neighborhoods there that you'd go into and nobody would say a word to you. You could cut the tension with a knife. It's not new. Historically, there's been tension between police and community, and the reason is because of the history of policing, not only uh, in Chicago, but in America in general. We have to find ways to confront it. We have to find ways to move forward. Now, we started to make a lot of progress in the 80s uh, with community policing. I had the honor of serving as uh, co-chair of the of the um, community policing project that uh, Chicago undertook. Dr. Wesley Scogan here from Northwestern was one of the people that came on board to evaluate uh, that particular project at the time. It was a five-year evaluation of exactly the impact it was having in our community. Now, I was not a huge proponent of community policing when I was given that assignment. I didn't understand it because I came up in an era where if you had more crime, you just hire more cops. And we would go into communities and it'd be very aggressive tactics, which by the way, some of those tactics would be used in minority communities. You wouldn't dare do it in non-minority uh, communities. That's just reality. But it was the police way of trying to get a handle on crime uh, at the time. So I went out and bought books and did some studying on what community policing was all about and worked to design a model for Chicago. And that's when I really started to understand the importance of actually building relationships and that you can't effectively police a community unless you have the trust of the people that you are serving. Uh, David mentioned that, you know, all the, um, the mass incarceration, the aggressive policing tactics that have been used these communities are still not safe. And that's true. And even if we can cite statistics, cite numbers, people don't care about numbers. I would walk into a community meeting um, when I was the commander on the west side of uh, Chicago in one of the toughest districts there, um, and I'd come in armed with statistics about, you know, homicides are down, shootings are down, and so forth. People in the community we're not as concerned about that as they were quality of life types of issues. So we learned that we had to not only deal with what we call part one crime, but we have to deal with quality of life. Community policing, of course, does that. And I believe we were making a lot of progress until this city, New York City, 
decided to change the way in which they address crime. And they became very data-driven, CompStat, something all of us have heard about, and many departments use. And it was very effective in terms of reducing crime. And you'd go to those same community meetings, and people would say, uh, commander or later chief, how come we aren't doing what they're doing in New York? So what did we do as a profession? We started becoming very data-driven. But we did it at the expense of building the relationships we need to build with communities. And I think that we underestimated to a large extent, at least I certainly did, and I think many others are guilty of the same thing, of underestimating just how fragile those relationships are. And again, they're fragile because of the history of policing. Now, just as we were starting to make inroads, some of us pulled back and we wound up, yeah, we reduced crime, but people didn't feel any safer. In fact, people began to really criticize many of the policing tactics that were being used. Uh, broken windows, for an example, something that George Kelling and James Q. Wilson um, wrote about back in 1982. It was really a foundation of what was being used here in the New York model. Uh, it can be very effective in terms of fighting crime, dealing with quality of life. The problem was, what do you do when the window is no longer broken, when it's fixed? How do you, how do you move from the strategies that you used when things were really out of control, drug trafficking and all that sort of thing, once things start getting back to normal, how do you start transferring some of that to community? How do you build communities to a point where they can sustain the kind of gains that you've made um, during the time that you were policing. How do you alert the community or inform people of exactly what you're doing? Because we'd go in and we'd wind up, yeah, we'd suppress crime, but we would alienate a huge percentage of people who lived in that area, whose kids went to school in that area because we didn't really know who they were. We had no real relationships there. And so there were a lot of mistakes that were made along the way, beginning with good intentions, but turned out to be mistakes nonetheless that I think added a lot to the tension. So I started to think about ways in which we can begin to build trust within communities and how can we really deal with the issue of, of race and policing. You know, race is still a topic that we really can't talk about in this country without emotions taking over people stopping, stop, stop listening, and we kind of shut down when we really have discussions about race. And I remember in 1998, when I was a brand new police chief in Washington, D.C., I got a letter from the um, uh, Anti-Defamation League inviting me to attend a, um, an event, actually it was take a tour of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum to meet the director there, take a tour of the museum, well, I'm brand new to Washington, D.C. I was spending time going to museums. I hadn't been to this one. I said, okay, fine, that's, you know, I'll spend a couple hours over there uh, at the museum. So I went. It was the most powerful experience that I had ever had in going to that museum. I had the good fortune of walking through with a survivor, a woman by the name of Irene Weiss, who was telling me her personal story as we were walking through the museum. Now, I didn't pay close attention when I was in high school during history class, but to be honest with you, in the 1960s, the Holocaust was something that was kind of skimmed over. I mean, you talked about World War II, really didn't spend any time talking about the Holocaust. So there were a lot of things about it I didn't know. But there was something that I had seen that I didn't quite know what it was, but it was troubling. So I came back a couple weeks later, unannounced. I took my time and went through the museum, and it didn't take long before I realized what it was. And that is the role of police during that period of time. I had no idea the role that police played in that period of time. Then I started thinking about it. And I said, now how could police officers who took an oath very similar to mine get involved in the activities that took place during uh, the Second World War, being part of killing squads, rounding up Jews, taking them to concentration camps, all those kinds of things. And then I started thinking that real, the real issue is the role of police in a democratic society. And if we understand the role of police in a democratic society, we start to address a lot of these issues that we're confronted with in policing. So I had a conversation with ADL in the museum. We sat down, we developed a curriculum. 
uh, that's in place now, law enforcement and society, more than 100,000 law enforcement professionals, federal, state, local, have gone through that program. Now, why did I pick the Holocaust? I picked it because it was long enough, it was far enough in history where the people going through weren't personally exposed to it. I saw it as a backdoor approach to deal with many of the issues that we have today without raising the anxiety, without raising the emotions. And we wound, after the museum tour, we have a facilitated discussion about the role of police right here in the United States, constitutional policing. You know, we take an oath, and every oath that I've ever seen that a police officer here takes has one line in it, and that is to protect the constitutional rights of all people. Yet when you ask the average police officer on the street what their role is, what are they going to say? Enforce the laws. Well, that's a very narrow part of what we do. But what if that response, instead of saying enforcing laws, we even call ourselves law enforcement officers, what if they responded by saying, my role is to protect the constitutional rights of all people? Do you think their behavior would be a little different? Do you think the way we would be perceived, we were perceived would be a little different? We do a good job of training cops with the technical aspects of policing. What report you make out for certain offense, crimes code, tactics, all those kinds of things. But the educational component is really missing in many of our academies. And that really circles, uh, revolves around the role of police talking about implicit bias. You know, we all have bias of some kind. May not necessarily be grounded in, in race or perceptions or anything like that, but we all have it. Understanding it, managing it. So now when you look at police training, you get courses like fair and impartial policing, for an example. That deals with the issue of implicit bias. You have classes on procedural justice. These are things that, in my day coming through, Nobody knew what the hell it was. And you're certainly not part of any kind of police training. So there has been some changes. But now add social media on top of it. Now we've got to deal with a reality that many people in many of our, our very challenged communities have known for a long time. And that is that uses of force on the part of police is not always justified. In fact, some's outright criminal. We have to be able to face that, hold people accountable, and deal with it. Now, we started a program at the Holocaust Museum when I was in Philadelphia. We have something there called the National Constitution Center. And I went there one day to see exactly what it is they do. Well, they, they, tour, they have tours, they take people through, and they focus on the evolution of democracy in the United States from 1776 to the current period of time. I sat down with the director and I said, what if you develop something for me that took a snapshot of policing during that same time frame? Now, in 1776, you wouldn't have had organized forces like we have now, but you might have had a, uh, an enforcement type function in the South. Maybe you were chasing down slaves. Maybe you were a watchman in some parts uh, of the country but you had a role nonetheless that really impacted a certain group of individuals more so uh, than others. They developed that program because when you look at policing in America and not talking about what happened in Europe or anywhere else in America, it becomes very, very clear that police have not always stood on the right side of justice as we would define justice today, looking at it through a 21st century lens. I mean, when you look at the civil rights era, uh, there are a lot of young people in the room here, but there's a little gray hair here too, uh, people that actually lived through uh, the civil rights era. I mean, who was waiting for the protesters, the demonstrators, as they walked across the Pettus Bridge and what later became Bloody Sunday? Cops. You saw in this film uh, images of police uh, letting dogs loose on people, firemen with hoses, uh, uh, breaking up demonstrations. Um, all those kinds of things, uh, a sign being posted by a police officer, whites only, by police order. There's baggage there. There's negative history. And my hat's off to my colleague Terry Cunningham for having the courage to stand up and acknowledge that publicly because it's not something we do enough of. 
But at the same time, we have to find a path forward. I was watching uh, Pastor Joel Osteen one time, and he said something that stuck with me. And he said, and it was that there's a reason why the rearview mirror on a car is smaller than the windshield. It's not designed for you to spend too much time looking at what's behind you. You got to look ahead. A glance back is good, but you have to focus on the future. You have to focus on the path forward. And when I was given the honor of co-chairing the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing with a very diverse group of people that were part of that, um, that was our focus. How do we move forward? How do we address areas that we need to be able to provide some kind of framework or guidance for departments for change? Now, the very first recommendation in the task force report is that there be a commission established to look at the entire criminal justice system. One mistake that's being made now, in my opinion, is focusing solely on police. And I think it was George Gascon that mentioned prosecutors need to be a part of it. Well, I'd go beyond that. Corrections, courts. It hasn't been done since 1965. Obviously, a lot has happened and changed since 1965. One disappointment I had was the president did not do that. I'm so optimistic that eventually maybe someone will. But we looked at areas like building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, but also officer safety and wellness. Because you look at the actions of some police officers in some areas, you know, police work in some very t intense areas of our cities. We talked about trauma-informed care. What kind of trauma do you think some of these officers experience when they go to these scenes and they see stuff that's just not normal to be exposed to on a daily basis? And yet, we do very little in our profession to deal with their mental health and their well-being from that perspective. You get shot or stabbed, we take good care of you. But when you get exposed to violence on a daily basis, and not just being at the scenes, you listen to the radio and call after call after call. Robbery, rape, murder. What does that do to a person over 20 years, over 30 years? We need to think about that. We need to think about the trauma that's inflicted upon the community in these, area, in, in these communities um, with just little things. And I, in, in Philadelphia, for an example, I made sure that if we cleared a homicide scene, Take all that tape down. Call the fire department and hose down the sidewalk. Some kids got to walk to school the next day. They don't need to be stepping over that stuff. We need to be able to inform our educators that, hey, last night there was a, a horrific incident that took place on this block. I know you've got four students that live on that block. They may have uh, either personally seen it, but they certainly have been exposed to it. If their behavior changes in school, you need to know this so you can get them the kind of intervention they need early on because that drives the behavior of a lot of these kids. It's the collateral damage. It's the collateral damage that's caused by the violence that takes place in our communities. And we need to all think about that kind of stuff and have plans in place to make sure that we're taking all these things in consideration as we root out the people who are really causing harm, real harm, in our communities. We can do it but it's gonna take a collective effort for us to be able to do it. But it starts with better recruiting of officers. It starts with, with taking care of their well-being, holding people accountable. You know, one last thing, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but we talk about police recruitment. You know, we, we talk all this stuff about, we want you know, off community policing, we want problem solvers, we want this, that, and the other. But you chiefs in the room, look at your recruiting video. Because you might find that, what, what do we have on the recruiting video? The SWAT team, the helicopters, boats, all the stuff you see on TV. That's how we recruit. And then you wonder why you don't have folks that have the skill set that you need to be effective in terms of interacting properly with the community. We have to be totally in sync if we're going to continue to move forward, if we're going to make progress. I have reached out to the African American History Museum in Washington. Right now, they are so swamped and overwhelmed, but I'd like to start a program there. Because again, history, history is important. We can't hide from it, we have to address it. But at some point, we gotta put it behind us and look at the future history that we can build together.
because that's the only way we're going to make real change in our society. So with that, thank you very much. God bless all of you, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Good morning, everyone. So, so it's very, very difficult to follow uh, Chuck Ramsey and Dave Kennedy for two reasons. One, because they're very eloquent, and two, they take all the time on the agenda, but that's okay. Uh, so I, I'm actually going to make my remarks very brief so we can try and get a little bit back on, on schedule here. So um, a lot of people have asked me the, the comments that I made at our conference uh, in San Diego. How did I get there? Why did I say what I said? Um, and, and about the timing. Was that the right time to do it? Was it the right thing to say? Was it right for the profession? So I'll just give you a little bit. I, I came in as president in October of uh, 2015, um, following you know, the Eric Gardner, uh, Ferguson, uh, the task force report. Um, and one of my presidential initiatives was really to try and operationalize the, the task force report that Chuck worked so hard on. Um, get the principles of police legitimacy and procedural justice out there to all 18,000 agencies you know, across this country. Um, and for the folks that don't know, IACP, we represent about 30,000 police executives in about 147 countries now. So pretty broad reach for us to be able to, to, to you know, uh, get the folks in the profession where it really makes a difference. So by July of, of last year, um, I call it two weeks in July, because July 6th of uh, 2016, when uh, Alton Sterling was uh, shot and killed in uh, Baton Rouge. Um, on the 5th, on the 6th, then you had the, the shooting of uh, Philando Castile. And then also on the 6th, you had uh, President Obama step off the plane and I think it was either Spain or Poland where he made some comments that were um, less than supportive of the police. Um, and quite frankly, I think folks in the law enforcement profession would agree that um, even the, the, uh, the president at the time was jumping to some conclusions and, and didn't give an opportunity for those investigations to, to move forward. Um, that, I, I remember that like it was, it was yesterday, that was on the 6th. On, on the 7th, it was a Thursday night um, when the 14 Dallas officers were shot, uh, five of them fatally. The next day, I happened to be down in D.C. Uh, for a meeting. The next day, I went to the IACP office, which is right in Old Town, Alexandria. Um, and we started to formulate a plan. We said, look, we need to talk to the president. This rhetoric has gotten gone so far now at this point. Nobody's talking to each other. Everybody's talking at each other. People are s screaming statistics on both sides. You've got law enforcement saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, we're 40 percent more likely to be killed by an African-American out there in the street than, um, you know, than, a, than a white subject. You've got, you know, the president and other folks, you know, screaming statistics back on, you know, an African-American male is more likely to be, you know, taken to jail, be imprisoned, um, be searched. Um, and at, at some point, quite frankly, those facts don't even matter anymore. People just aren't listening to each other. So over that, that, that weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, we, you know, we were in touch with the folks at the White House and asked to have a meeting with the, with the president directly. By Monday morning, um, we, we convened a meeting in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. Uh, the Vice President was there, President Obama was there, and what they call the nine big you know, law enforcement organizations were all represented, major city chiefs, major county sheriffs, National Sheriff's Association, IACP, uh, Noble was there. So all of our partners were at the table. Uh, Vice President opened it up and then the President walked in from the side door and he walked in and he said, look, I want this to be a very candid, open conversation. He said, I know that there are some folks in the room that uh, believe that, that some of the things that I've said were, were less than supportive of law enforcement. Um, and he said, you know, quite frankly, I have to, I have to understand that for me to have standing and legitimacy in this, in this space, um, I need to see this from both sides, and I need to be able to support the folks from Black Lives Matter, Campaign Zero, and also be able to support law enforcement. Um, but he said, look, we're going to take all the time it needs this morning to talk about this, and, but I want it to be a real, open, frank, candid conversation. And then he turned the floor over to me. Um, and you know, having no idea what the foundation was at that point and, and what to say, um, you know, I turned to him and I said, you know, Mr. President, somebody who fervently supports reform and who has pushed the task force report, has tried to operationalize it, has made it one of my top priorities. Um, it's frustrating for me. It's disappointing. It's depressing when I hear you as the president come out and make comments that are less than supportive of law enforcement. Um, I mean, I get all the high-profile um, use of force cases that were happening. 
But you know what? You got to think about the other 99.9% .9 of the law enforcement community that's out there that, that, that's really trying to do the right thing on a, on a daily basis and people that are trying to push reform. And he said, well, you know, I think we really need to go back and take a look at the record. I don't think I, you know, my comments were real, really that bad. And I said, well, you know, Mr. President, you're, you're a brilliant man and a constitutional scholar, and I don't think we really need to look at the record. I think that most folks in the room would agree. Um, and, and I mean, I, I, I certainly give the man credit. He, he was gracious enough to say, I, I understand you know, where you're coming from, but, but what specifically, what could I do better? Um, and I said, you know, it's, it's interesting. You call the families of the folks in, in a lot of these high profile use of force cases, um, and, but you don't call the families of law enforcement when we lose an officer out there. And I said, you know, 100, you know 130 officers a year, um, you know, probably about 100 of them to, to firearms violence. It would really make a difference if you could call the families. He says, well, I write a personalized note to them all so that they can keep it. Um, he says, great, but the telephone call would make a difference. And, you know, we just asked you in March, there was a, a Virginia trooper that had been killed, and we asked you to call his widow and his family. And, um, and you didn't do it. Um, so we went around the room and other folks, you know, you know, had, had an opportunity to, to direct the president or speak to the uh, president directly. And then just as the president was getting up to leave, I made a comment to him about uh, something to the effect of, hey, you know, specifically, you asked me what, what you could do. What can we do? How can we tamp down this vituperative demagoguery that's out there right now? How can we stop this violence now that's targeted against the police? How can we get people out of their corners? And I remember he turned around, he came back in, he sat down, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know what we could start? We could start if the people in the law enforcement profession, people who are leaders, if they could stand up and make an acknowledgement that you know what, they've been part of this dark his history that got us to where we are today. And you know, then he got up and he walked out of the room. And I remember reflecting on it. And then two days later, the next day was the memorial service for the Dallas officers. Two days later, we were back in the White House. Chuck was there uh, for a meeting with a much larger group with you know, a lot of the civil rights uh, organizations and politicians. And, and the, the president was much more supportive of law enforcement in that, re in that meeting than he had been. And then by July 17th, you had the shooting of the uh, Baton Rouge officers, six officers shot, and uh, three of them uh, killed. Um, and the president came out with a statement that was very supportive of law enforcement. And I'm thinking to myself that, you know, I think he, he listened to us in those two meetings that we had. And I have an obligation now to follow through on what he said to me. So I started working on my comments on, uh, on making an acknowledgement, which then worked into an apology. I took it to the board of directors at IACP, didn't tell them exactly what I was going to say. I just said, this is what I'm thinking about. I'm not sure when I'm going to do it, what the opportunity is going to be. And then it wasn't until um, October. Uh, the night before I decided to do it, I called our executive director and said, it's tomorrow at the General Assembly. There'll be between five and 7,000 law enforcement executives there. Um, I'm going to stand up and, and make the statement. He says, are you sure? Um, I said, no, I, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I'm going to not ha have the bully pulpit after that. And if I can save one officer's life, and if I can draw just one group out of the corner so, so that we can start to have this discussion, a real conversation about this. I stood up, I made my comments, I knew it was going to be controversial, I had no idea how controversial. Um, to be honest with you, I received death threats, both from law enforcement and folks on the other side. Um, people said I didn't go far enough, people said I went too far, I knew I found the sweet spot, everybody hated me. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was an incredible um, journey. And then, just to, just to close, at the very end of that, um, by November, I went to speak to the FBI National Academy, 250 of the best and the brightest in law enforcement from around the world. I always go in and talk about IAC, IACP and the virtues of joining the organization. And I walked in with my PowerPoint, and I'm ready to go, and, and uh, three of the instructors grabbed me as soon as I walked in. They said, hey, before you walk in there, you've got some angry people in there, all right? He said, first of all, they were very upset about your comments. Uh, you had no right to apologize on behalf of the profession. You had no right to apologize on, on their behalf. Um, so I walked into the room, put the PowerPoint aside. I said, okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. And I said, um, wh why do you feel that way? And people got up and they were you know, shouting at me. And, and then finally I said, wait a minute, when you put that uniform, because they said it wasn't me. I, I've never been disrespectful. I've never been biased in any of the actions that I've taken. I said, yeah, but when you put that uniform on, you put all that history on with it. You have to understand that. Um, the next day, I went to Howard University to speak to them. And I was standing there, I said, okay, I'm gonna get some support here. It was just the opposite. <laughs> 
they said, you know what, you didn't go far enough, you didn't, I said, okay, this is it, I'm done, right? Um, no, but it, look, I, I have to tell you that, you know, IACP, it doesn't matter, I mean, I heard somebody up here, I think it was David, that talked about, or maybe it was the president, that talked about the administration and, and where we go from here. Um, the IACP's position is we don't change our policies uh, dependent on who, who inhabits the White House. This is just way too important for us, and we have to build on on the successes that we've had over the, um, the past, you know, five years and even ten years. Um, and for me, this is just the first step. So thanks, David. Thanks for inviting me, and I appreciate it.